Imagine a place with no cars or housing additions or even without a McDonald's, where the beauty of nature surrounds you and where few people have traveled. What would happen to such a place if people began to live there? This was the painter Thomas Cole's concern. In his landscapes, Thomas Cole depicted the untouched wilderness that might soon be lost as cities grew and the land was settled. In Thomas Cole's painting, Storm King of the Hudson, a very small figure on the left travels down a path toward us. The worn path gives us hints that this place has been visited before. Look to the right. Do you see the cut rocks? Who might have put them there? Look up to the sky. Against gathering storm clouds, the treacherous cliffs and twisted gnarled trees look threatening. Storm King Mountain, the artist's subject, lies on the west bank of the Hudson River, just north of West Point. It got its name because storm clouds seem to gather there, as in this painting. This painting also shows that the land of the middle colonies was rich with growth and rolling hills. Inspired by paintings and writings describing the Hudson River Valley, many people began to travel there to see what authors called the beauty and spirit of nature. As more tourists sought out the splendid scenery in the Hudson River Valley, some people, like Thomas Cole, feared the visitors would leave their mark, changing the landscape forever. In this painting by George Smiley, we see a lone figure emerging from the woods into a peaceful autumn countryside. This landscape depicts the tranquil and beautiful middle colonies. Attention to detail was very important to painters of this landscape. What details do you see? Look to the background. Notice the neatly cultivated fields and the small farmhouses. These elements show that people in the middle colonies relied on the land for their food, shelter, and clothing. These people were mainly hard-working, self-sufficient farmers. The land of the middle colonies was fertile and rich with forests and rivers. Another artist who painted the middle colonies was Thomas Cole. Do you remember his painting titled Storm King of the Hudson? Unlike Cole, who emphasizes the power of the raw, uncontrollable wilderness, Smiley shows us how people began to control nature through farming and building houses. The Catskill Mountains lie to the west of the Hudson River in southeastern New York. Part of the Appalachian Mountain system, the Catskills contain many lakes and tall peaks. With woods, gorges, waterfalls, and hills, the Catskills provided painters with an endless variety of scenic vistas. Thomas Doughty preferred to focus on the peaceful aspects of the American wilderness. When he painted this, he lived in Boston, but Doughty liked to take sketching trips to the Catskill Mountains. In 1836 and in 1837, he made several paintings of sites there. In his Catskill paintings, as in this one, he usually included water and hazy background hills. He almost always put people in his landscapes, usually small figures off to one side. Edward Lampson Henry painted many New York churches, making faithful records of American architecture. This small painting depicts St. Paul's Church in Lower Manhattan, New York City. Dedicated in 1766, St. Paul's is today the oldest church standing in Manhattan. George Washington had a designated pew there. Throughout his life, Sanford Gifford sketched in the many mountain ranges of New York and the eastern United States. The Catskills were one of the sites he favored. This painting is an oil sketch. Small and quickly done, it could later be referred to in making a larger painting. Like most artists of his day, Sanford Gifford made larger, more detailed paintings for exhibition. Art critics and Gifford's patrons and colleagues appreciated the artist's work for its sense of quiet and peacefulness and its glowing light. In the 19th century, Niagara Falls, shown here in a painting done in 1875, captured the American imagination. The Niagara River, in which the falls are located, flows between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. The river separates the northwest corner of New York State from Canada. By the mid-1800s, the falls had become a popular tourist spot and an important symbol for America's strength and rich natural resources. Artists and tourists had been attracted to Niagara Falls throughout the 19th century. Artist William Morris Hunt also painted the rapids above the falls, a less common subject for artists. Goat Island separates the Canadian Falls, also called the Horseshoe Falls, from the United States Falls. Just south of Goat Island lie the Three Sisters Islands, probably the site of Hunt's painting. Taking time off from his career as a portrait painter in Boston, Hunt vacationed at the falls in the late spring of 1878. There is nothing like Niagara in June, he wrote to a pupil. Excited by the majesty of the falls and the quality of the northern light, 
Hunt quickly sent for his assistant and his studio van, a horse-drawn cart made by a builder of gypsy wagons with room for sleeping and storing utensils and painting materials. Once equipped, Hunt painted numerous views of both the falls and the rapids, paintings that proved to be his last landscapes. While at Niagara, Hunt was called to the state capitol at Albany to paint murals there. The exhausting job occupied Hunt for over a year. Shortly after finishing the murals, Hunt went to Appledore Island to rest. But tragedy struck. While there, he drowned off the rocky cliffs. Hunt's landscapes of Niagara Falls had been his last landscape paintings. Montclair in northeastern New Jersey was settled in 1666 and served as George Washington's headquarters in 1780. In the 19th century and today, it acts as a residential suburb for New York City and Newark, New Jersey. In 1878, painter George Innes bought a home in Montclair, whose woods provided a favorite subject. The Delaware River forms the eastern border of Pennsylvania, separating it from New York and New Jersey. Eakins painted this from what is now Gloucester City, New Jersey, near Camden and across the river from Philadelphia. In Eakins' time, shadfish swam near the river's shore, where fishermen cast and hauled in their nets. Eakins' family and others strolled along the river to watch. Eakins was so intrigued by the river activity that he painted several versions of this scene. In northeastern New York run the Adirondack Mountains. By the mid-1800s, the Adirondacks had become a very popular recreational site. By the 1870s, the railroad was bringing countless tourists into the area. Many of these tourists required guides, like the one shown in this watercolor, who knew the isolated backwoods. Scholars have identified this man as either Michael Farmer Flynn, an Adirondack guide, or as Wiley Gatchell, one of the artist's neighbors in Maine who served as a model. The artist Winslow Homer first went to the Adirondacks in 1870. He stayed at a private hunting and fishing club called the North Woods Club near Minerva in Essex County, New York. During his many visits there, he painted a large number of watercolors of Adirondack scenes, mostly of hunting, fishing, and logging. Indiana-born William Merritt Chase did this and several other paintings in the resort area of the Shinnecock Hills near Southampton, Long Island. There, he and his family had a summer home, complete with a studio, facing the beach along Long Island's Great Peconic Bay. In this painting, small colorful bushes are Chase's interpretation of the ferns, bay bushes, and heather that grew there. Today, descendants of the Shinnecock Indians live on a reservation nearby. This painting depicts a Japanese footbridge near Shady Brook, the boarding house where artist Alfred Maurer stayed during the summer. During the colder months of the year, Maurer lived with his father in New York City. In the summer, he went north of New York City to the town of Marlboro on the west bank of the Hudson River. Marlboro was known then as Marlboro on the Hudson. Maurer liked to use bright colors in his paintings to express the lushness of nature he found in his summer retreat. About 10 miles southeast of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, lie the Isles of Shoals on the Maine and New Hampshire state line. These rocky islands, occupying about one square mile, attracted artists to their coasts. At the Isles of Shoals, the painter Child Hassam and other artists, writers, and musicians congregated at the popular resort on Appledore Island. There, Child Hassam had a studio near the island's hotel. He painted almost 400 canvases of island scenes, including several of Appledore Island's granite cliffs, like those in this painting. Old Lyme, Connecticut lies near the mouth of the Connecticut River on the shore of Long Island Sound, the body of water between Long Island, New York, and Connecticut. In the summer, artists and city dwellers traveled to Old Lyme to escape the heat of Boston or of New York City. In 1903, Child Hassam went to Old Lyme, site of a lively gathering of artists. There, he painted Bow Bridge, pictured here, probably the first painting he did at Old Lyme. When he showed this painting in an exhibition at Old Lyme, one critic called it a delightful bit of open-air realism. In the hills and small towns around Cornish, New Hampshire, thrived an active but sprawling artist colony. Painter Willard Leroy Metcalf went there regularly between 1909 and 1920, lured by the winter and spring scenery. Artists associated with the Cornish artist colony lived not only in Cornish, but also in the nearby New Hampshire villages of Cornish City, Cornish Flat, South Cornish, Plainfield, and Windsor, Vermont. Metcalf probably painted this at Plainfield, New Hampshire. 
In August of 1922, Willard Leroy Metcalf wrote to his daughter that he intended to go to Chester, Vermont to paint the springtime up there. He then spent the fall of 1922 and the spring of 1923 in Chester, around which meandered the Little Williams River. Metcalf may have painted a gray thaw on the banks of the Little Williams River. Early in 1922, after his wife had left him and following some professional setbacks, Metcalf lapsed into a bout of drunkenness. By February, he had promised to stop drinking and enthusiastically turned again to painting in his beloved New England. Indiana artist John Otis Adams painted this scene on the bank of the White River in Muncie. Small houses in the background show Muncie's development over a hundred years ago. When he painted this, Adams had just returned from studying art in Munich, Germany at an art academy there. Like many American painters, Indiana artists went to Europe to study. In Brookville, Indiana, on the bank of the Whitewater River, John Otis Adams and his wife shared a home with another couple, artist T.C. Steele and his wife. Adams liked to paint the cultivated and wild flower beds, like the bright red poppies seen here, that flourished in the soil around his Brookville home.